Right, thank you very much. So this talk is going to be a weird one, because I'm not really going to talk about Rust. I'm going to talk about a project I did in Rust. Uh, I'm going to recap some history, and I hope there's some takeaways um, that you can you know, be enthused to go and do your own projects. And I'm going to start with this. Does anyone know what this is? It would be amazing. A van? Yeah, good. This is a Mazda Bongo Friendy. I'm not making it up. Check it up on Wikipedia. And uh, my family had one. My brother had one. And the engine went bang. And this is uh, 2013, and it's a diesel engine. And we said, well, you could put a new diesel engine in it, but that sucks. So we're going to buy one of these. This is a Lexus LS V8. So we took the engine from it, and we put it in the Mazda. I say we. My brother did all the work. There's a point to this. We'll get there. And so we made this. We called it the Lexgo Bonus, because it's a Lexus Bongo. Uh, the engine sits under the driver's seat. Interesting, but irrelevant for the purposes of this talk. What's relevant is that Lexus Electronics don't talk to Mazda Electronics. They're different. And this is where I started my hobby of embedded engineering, because I went, I'm an embedded engineer professionally. I can make a thing to fix that. So I made this. Uh, this is a Texas Instruments uh, developer kit you could buy back then. Back then it was cheap. Now it's quite expensive. And I designed a PCB because I needed to convert the gearbox uh, speed sensor to the speedometer, because they didn't connect together. They were electrically different. Um, and the rev counter showed the wrong number of revs, different kind of engine. So I designed this thing, and it had a little LCD. So it was like a cool little uh, sort of synth wave, I guess, uh, dashboard. And this is relevant to the story, because this is the start of my embedded journey. And the software you can get from Texas Instruments was, I'll be honest, it's, it's not good. I'm sorry if there's people from TI here, but if you're going to make me download a 340 megabyte installer just to get the libraries to start your chip up, and if you're going to make me click through end user license agreements, promises I'm not going to export it to the axis of evil, it's just a barrier. So I went to hell with that, and I wrote it all from scratch in C, because this is 2013, and I was a C programmer back then. I have apologized for my sins. I'm trying to do better. Uh, so it's built with scones, and yeah, it's all MIT, and it was what well, we did GitHub 11 years ago. So this is where I started rewriting this software from scratch. Fast forward a few years. Does anybody recognize this? Good, yeah, I see some very enthusiastic hands waving. This is ETH in Zurich, because this was Rustfest Zurich. It was my first conference. It was amazing. I thought, I found my crowd. I love these people. I work with uh, some of these people now. And I was thinking, OK, I want to do a project. I've done some stuff on my desktop machine. I want to do some embedded stuff. I can dig out the hardware that I had before that went in the Lexgo bonus. And there's no real reason other than that. I'd only chosen it because I'd randomly found it. And I only did Rust on it because I happened to have one lying around. Some rust from 2018. I've been spelunking through the archives. GitHub does not make it easy. Look at the feature flags. Look at what we had to do to write embedded rust in early 2018. ASM, compiler built in lib, const fun, core intrinsics, global allocator, lang items, naked functions, never type. We stabilized the never type yet. Uh, and start. We don't have to do any of that. 2018 edition fixed all of this. Of course, I didn't have the, uh, the Mazda Lexus camber van to work on, so I'm like, what am I going to do with this board? LEDs are boring. What's like a hard real-time problem? And I thought, I'm going to make video with it. So here's a photograph. I mean, basically, we're going to go through my photo album. This is sort of like a photo diary. There are no bullet points. Um, it's all photos. Uh, so this is a photo of the, uh, that little Texas Instruments board making video in Rust. And it's a really interesting, hard, real-time problem. And I've given talks on this before. Um, you can find them um, on YouTube. I'll give you some details later. So we're making some couple of characters, the green AA there, and some stripes. Very exciting. A lot of things have to go right to make this work. So here's a question. How many people keep random notebooks? Keep notes in. And how many people keep random notebooks in a multitude of like random places, and instead of just keeping them in one? Excellent. You are my people. I love you. I house this foot. There's like a notebook in every room, and I just pick it up and put some notes in it and never find them again. It's amazing. It's like using Git. 
And so this is what the hardware uh, looked like. It's a big mess of wires, and um, yeah, I took this to uh, this place. I don't have to ask you where this is. It's clearly Paris. Um, I took it to Rustfest Paris, and I think I crashed the AV system, because look at it. It's a nightmare. But it makes video. And I took it on the road, and we took it to Rustfest Paris, and we told this story of the hardware, and this project um, came to be called the Monotron. Um, so it sort of has a, a sort of a menu system, and you can enter commands. It's all a bit of a cheat because you have to enter them over a serial port. Obviously, it's a big mess of wires, so I could do better. Let's do Veraboard. Um, that's a step forward from the mess of wires. So this was sort of the next iteration. It's a little bit neater. There's a little amplifier on the side there because it could start to make some sort of beeps and boops. My next Rust event. Does anyone remember? Uh, I think it's Zinnemann's Roadhouse. Was anyone in Ann Arbor for Rust Belt Rust 2018? Another great conference, had a lot of fun. We played this. I set this embedded hardware up in the lobby of the conference center. We played Snake. Uh, confession time, it, Snake is actually a program written in C, and I was just running it on the sort of operating system I had written in Rust. In my defense, it's got the author's name on it. That's not me, it was never my game. We had a lot of fun playing this. The board is sort of starting to feel like a computer, maybe. You can play things on it, run applications on it. I have many other talks where I go into exactly what is a computer. So this is late 2018, I think, and I start watching a lot of YouTube. It's a dangerous rabbit hole to go down. You meet people like these people. This is Neil from RMC and Steve Jones, and they're talking about all the all the new modern retro hardware they've been working on and making. He's sort of an Amiga emulator. I thought, wow, I made a PCB back in 2013. I want to make another PCB. Seems like fun. I say, Mom, I want a PCB. And Mom says, we have PCBs at home. PCBs at home look like this. I mean, this is actually a useful thing, right? You should print your PCBs on paper before you order them, because it's much cheaper to print another one when you realize it's wrong. The very observant of you might notice, for example, that the footprint for the audio jack is the wrong way round. I found that out. I ordered some PCBs. It started to feel like a, a thing, and then we can make some video using the PCBs. It works, and it's exciting, and I can fit all of the connectors. And the keyboard didn't work. Um, turns out I'd read the diagram wrong, and it said from below, and I'd sort of read it as from above, so I drew the connector mirrored left to right. And I had the PCBs made, and the pins are swapped left to right. And the fix for that is to fit the connector to the underside of the PCB. And then we were going. We had keyboard support working. A lot of stuff has gone on um, over the sort of the past six years. I decided to have an extension built in my house. This picture just gives you a little sense of what my life is like. It's a building site. We've built an extension on the side of the house. There is no kitchen. There's barely anywhere to do laundry. I've ordered myself a takeaway, and I've taken the only working table we have, and I've used it to do embedded rust so I can get ready for my next demo. I've got speakers there. We've got the extra screen, the keyboard, and so on. So the next thing we needed was a way to get data in and out of the machine. So I started working on a library to talk to SD cards. I didn't know how this could be done. I had to look up the spec. You can get the spec. Of course, I did it in Rust. And this is the great thing about having a language that promotes a modular ecosystem. I was able to publish it. I called it Embedded SDMMC, because it's for SD cards and MMC cards. They're slightly older. And it's on GitHub. And the other day, I found out that GitHub has an Insights tab, and it can tell you how many other projects on GitHub are referring to your project. And there are 326 repositories on GitHub, apparently, using this uh, idiotic SD card driver that I wrote so I could basically do a gag at a, uh, at a conference, which, uh, I'll be honest, keeps me awake at night. I really hope none of these people are actually using it for data they care about. I very, very much mean it when I quote the MIT license and say, no warranty is given, express or implied. This may blow up, and I'm not responsible. If you want to help out, it's on GitHub. Come and check out. There's, there's open issues. There's things we can work on. So my next conference is uh, RustConf 
2019, this was sort of the, gran the grand finale of the Monotron project. Uh, hands up if anyone went to the talk or has seen it on YouTube. A couple of people may I see a few hands. I think check it out, it's kind of interesting. I turn up with a MIDI keyboard, because uh, the system's got a MIDI interface. I wrote a synthesizer from scratch in Rust. I published that, played a bit of Van Halen during the talk. I wrote a presentation package for the Monotron, and I delivered the entire set of slides using that PCB I had made, which nobody realized until the end of the talk, and I just quit the program. Um, yeah, it was great. And, and this, is, this is kind of the, the point of the talk, right? How do you follow that? It's sort of a great talk, great response. Like, what next? I crammed all of these features into this chip that was never supposed to do these things. You know, I've effectively taught a chicken to go woof. It's really funny, and it's really impressive, and it serves absolutely no practical purpose. There's literally no point to it. But I did it because it was kind of fun. And so I'm sat here in my home office. It's now finished. I've got nice space. You see, it's all neat and tidy. This comes up again later. And I'm like, where do we go from here? And this is where we get to throwing it all in the bin. And I've been talking to people, and we had some ideas, and I thought, the problem is it's not portable. I'm fixed onto a very specific hardware platform. I'm touching hardware registers in the middle of drawing video, in the middle of dealing with the keyboard. There's no layers of abstraction. It's a mess. Was this a mistake? I guess is the question you're going to have to answer for yourselves. But that first project took 12 months, and I've spent four years trying to do the same thing again, and I've not quite got there, but I'm doing it properly this time. So the design of this system, the Neotron system, is based on, again, old computers. It's my favorite topic after Rust. Uh, anyone know what movie this was famously in? Yeah, I see some hands here. Yeah, Matthew Broderick is using this in war games. It was using up to, uh, yeah, I see some nods. Go, yeah, I knew that. Good, good. IMSI 8080. Uh, you load software into it by fiddling, twiggling the uh, switches on the front. Um, it's got no ROM chips. You have to program the first few instructions yourself. But anyway, the IMSI 8080 for the mid-70s, the Commodore 128, and the Amstrad PCW word processor, also known as the Schneider Joyce. What do these weird three machines have in common? The answer is they all run CPM, this operating system that runs on machines with a, an Intel 8080 processor. And I looked at it, this is a good idea. There's different machines, and they run the same code. How can I design a Rust program that is portable and will run across these different things? I don't have the standard library available to do this work for me. How are we going to make this work? And so this is the architecture of CPM, and this was the kind of the idea that I came up with. There's a BIOS, a basic input-output system that deals with the hardware. It's the only thing that knows where the serial parts are, where the screen is, and so on. Knows how to talk to the disk drive. The middle layer is the BDOS, the basic disk operating system. And this is the thing that knows about file systems and loading applications and memory management. And then they had the command console processor, the CCP. And that was the shell, the thing you could type the commands in, dir, pip, and so on. So this is the idea I took for uh, Neotron. I have the Neotron OS is a Rust application, and I have a Neotron BIOS, which is a different Rust application. And then you get into very interesting questions about how do I compile two different applications, two different versions of the Rust compiler, and get them to talk to each other. I really hope we get the Krabby API soon, because I've had to reinvent all of that from scratch to make this work. You can check it all out on the GitHub. So new operating system, new start. We're going to need some new hardware. So yep, design some things, throw all of the features onto the board. I even have a little go at doing some laser cutting. And then we get about as far as this. So I've ripped out the video renderer, and I've put it in the BIOS. And I've started writing an operating system. And the only thing the operating system can do is print the word tick once per second. But you know, it's going. One Rust application is starting another one using this extern C API I've designed um, between them. But there's weird glitches. I don't know. To this day, I do not know how this is possible on this hardware. Every other scan line has gone black, but only at the bottom of the screen, and not for that weird portion which is working perfectly. 
Like, I literally don't know how this, how this can happen. This is the life of an embedded programmer. Um, I don't know, by way of an excuse, justification, why this has taken so long, I got into local po politics. They made me the mayor of my local town. We're getting into early 2020. 2020 was going to be an amazing year, right? Really excited about this. Does anyone else remember what happened in 2020? It was, uh, it was, it was a hell of a time barriers to make pedestrian areas wider, me sitting broodily in a park thinking, what the, just, yeah, I think that face, the beard, I think, says, says a lot about where I am. And then we get to the end of 2020, and my entire town floods on Christmas Eve, but it doesn't flood with nice rainwater. I'm afraid it floods with water from below, because the sewage system backs up, and yeah, local Madonna, yeah, no, I, and I'm in charge at this point. So I decided the best thing to do with 2020 was to bury it. So here's me in the newspaper with my time capsule project, and I packed 2020 into a can, and I buried it in the museum garden, and I said, we're done with it, and I look forward to 2021. Um, yeah, I was, I was optimistic. 2021 comes along, and this happens. Raspberry Pi launch a new processor. The board is called the Pi Pico, and the processor on it is called the RP2040. RP2040 has far too many syllables in it for me to talk about during this talk, so I'm just going to call it the $1 micro. The $1 micro has eight times as much RAM as I had last time, twice as many processor cores, is 50% faster, and is a fraction of the price. I did a charity live stream trying to raise money um, as the mayor of my town. We sat down. I didn't read the data sheet. I didn't read, do any prep. I turned on Twitch, my one and only Twitch stream, and I said, I will start with this board, and we will get Rust running on it before this stream ends. And about five hours later, we had a blinking light on the RP2040 in Rust about three days after the chip was launched. We raised about 350 pounds uh, for charity. And that then started the RPRS project. Other people were doing similar things, and this is now one of the best supported chips, I think, for Rust embedded development. Go and check out the Raspberry Pi Pico and all the stuff that's going on there. There's a, a great bunch of people. That beautiful, clean office I was working in, yeah, that didn't last. Turns out I really like collecting old stuff. It's a, that is a, a tractor feed, a paper feeder for a daisy wheel printer. Yeah, I know, my life is a mess. Um, a new chip needs new hardware, JLC PCB, great place to get PCBs, they turn up like this. I don't think this is ESD safe, but at the price I'm paying, I wasn't going to argue. It turns up like this, I've made a micro ATX PCB, you can put it in a PC case, uh, it's got VGA connectors, sound, SD card, it's got expansion slots. It was the lesson I learned, here's a top tip, don't put all the hardware on the PCB, Give yourself expansion slots, and then you can swap out bits and pieces later. Here is an example of the first video running on the RP2040. I know it only looks like a red stripe on the screen, but believe me, this, this an incredible amount of stuff has to go right for this to work, and very often things go wrong. You'll notice this text does not go all the way to the edge of the screen, and it has this beautiful sort of shading pattern where the background color changes the start of the characters to the bottom, that's not supposed to happen. That is some kind of weird DMA memory corruption interrupt shenanigans. Maybe it's because I use static mute. I don't know what the hell is going on here. It's, it was a mess. But we got there. I managed to get 80 column video working. The Monotron never did 80 columns of video. 80 columns is the standard. It's what the PC used. Um, it's still what we set our text editors today. It actually comes from a design of punch card. So if you believe in folding all of your code at the 80 column marker, good, because you could then punch your code onto a sort of a Hollerith punch card and it will still fit. Good work. Um, so we've got 80 column color text. Uh, there's two. Pi Picos in this picture. See, the one at the top that's held on with sticky tape is the programmer. You don't have to buy real programmers. You can just program a Pi Pico, and it works as a flash tool. It's great. I don't recommend it, though, because all the pins are exposed. And if that sticky tape gives up and my board falls down and touches the 12 volts, that's bad. Buy this instead. This one comes in a case. It's a really good piece of kit. You can get it from Raspberry Pi. I recommend that. 
other things that have gone wrong in my new design. Any electronics engineers can immediately spot what's going on here. What if I tell you the pin at the top is the ground pin, and I've connected it to power, and the pin at the bottom is power, and I've connected it to ground? Because I rotated the symbol, because it was better off that way round. Yeah, so now as soon as I powered up that part of the board, uh, there was I mean, a small fire is overdoing it. There was, there was definitely a bad smell. Um, 2021 going into 2022 continued to kick me in the ass because my kitchen flooded as if we hadn't had enough flooding. That brand new kitchen we put in with the extension, the whole thing had to be ripped out. All the lino had to be taken up. We lived in a hotel for a week or two. Industrial dryers. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm giving you excuses as to why this has taken so long. Um, but we did a demo of the first version at ACCU. You can check out this talk on um, YouTube. Here's another top tip. Don't look at the comments. I mean, just don't. Just, if there's a video on YouTube, don't read it. Mainly, this is people going, he didn't talk enough about Rust. I mean, I blame you lot for that. Um, he's too much talking about computer history. I really like computer history, but all right, yeah, fair enough. Lesson learned. And so this was sort of bubbling along, and I was working on things. And then the Rust Foundation said, uh, you know, we have coin if you have wares. And I'm like, ooh, I like money. I could spend some money on some stuff. So I said, I will make 25 PCBs if you give me enough money to buy them and all the parts. And I submitted that, and I was like, lol, then they're going to give me money for hardware. This is the Rust Foundation. They do Rust. And they sent me an email and said, congratulations, you have money. Um, and we think you're an idiot and you didn't ask for enough, so have a little bit more because we really don't think you can pull it off. Um, so I got a Rust Foundation grant and I spent it all on hardware. So it turns out I'd actually sent up a hardware manufacturing business, ordered more PCBs, very reasonably priced. I have to say, making PCBs is fun and you should do it. And they turn up like this. Some things have moved around, the expansion cards have gone purple. Uh, but this is what it all looks like, fully loaded. I've made five of these. There were a couple of things to fix. Uh, so this is uh, me doing some testing on the uh, hardware. Uh, we're blinking some lights on an expansion card. And there's a lot has to happen to make this work. There's an I.O. controller. You have to tell it, please select slot three on the bus. Slot three is activated. You can then talk to the card. But here's the, here's the secret. Here's the, uh, the needle scratch. I'm testing my board in MicroPython. Here's a top tip. You don't have to write Rust. It's not like a legal requirement. The Rust Evangelism Strike Force is not going to come to your house. MicroPython is a perfectly cromulent way to test your PCBs, and you should just use it. Because you can open a REPL and go pin high, pin low, drive the bus, whatever. It's fine. Do your own thing. Uh, my office continues to get filled with even more stuff. I've bought three more computers since this picture was taken. No, I don't know where I'm going to put them. Um, I was unable to bring the hardware today, and I'm really sad about that, because I know people know me for bringing hardware to demos. But I've tried to bring you some videos. So this is what the programming experience uh, looks like. So if we play the video, so in my editor, I'm going to hit Cargo Run, and I'm programming the board management controller. There's a second processor that does the power supply, and it does the keyboard, and it handles the reset. So that gold thing is my ST programmer. I'm going to press the power button, and the light's going to go solid. And then I'm going to tap on the keyboard, and then every time I tap on the keyboard, the speaker's going to go beep. So hopefully we'll get some audio. There we go. Hold the key down. Good. It seems like a really unimpressive demo, right? You're just like, this guy's like typing on a keyboard and it's going beep. You would not believe how many things have to go right for that to happen. But we got there. We made it work. Then once the keyboard's going, you can start to put the interface back in and the commands and so on. We had to do a second rev on the hardware, and this is the one I ordered 25 off. Uh, did I say I offered to do a hardware project in the middle of a chip shortage? It was a nightmare getting parts. It was a terrible idea. I'm buying things, you know, boxes of 50, assembling the kits. I mean, if you've got one of these boards, I hope you love it, because I did not enjoy putting the kits together. It's not my thing. I'd stick to software. This was a big pain. And it's lovely when you're ordering parts and then manufacturers cancel, the vendors cancel the order on you and go, I'm sorry, you can't have that for six months. And it's also fun when stuff turns up broken and you have to go and order replacements. But we got there. I shipped these boards out. They weren't very functional from a software point of view, but we've been working on it. And now other people have the hardware. We can work on it together as a collaborative thing. 
So we're doing 80 column text, and now there are multiple colors going on on screen because I wrote a full ANSI parser. ANSI is the standard for doing color graphics in your console. Um, and so, yeah, when I have one of those, it's part of the system. We can do full 80 column color. We can do 60 line color. I think it makes it a proper computer. You could really actually build applications with this kind of thing. And I've taken it to shows. Here I am at the Cambridge Make Space um, at a cam jam. This is labeled as computers doing the wrong thing, because frankly, a $1 microcontroller should not be like running an operating system and doing all of this stuff. The SD card support comes back. It's the great thing about pushing stuff off into crates. Uh, there's now hot plug um, eject support for the SD card. Again, a ton of work to get that going, but we can detect the card, and we can start doing file system stuff. Uh, apologies to my family. This is the card I used to back up their Sims 3 save games, which is why it's called Carry Scarlet and Amelia, but I needed a real card to test. Don't judge me. Um, file system stuff is tricky, kind of hard to test on an embedded system, so what about this? Looks kind of the same, right? This is a macOS application. I wrote an application in Rust that uses a crate to make me a frame buffer window on the screen. I then compiled the operating system as a dynamic library. It's Rust. It doesn't have to be compiled for ARM. You can compile it for, as a macOS library. I then load the library into the GUI application, and I'm running the exact same operating system, the exact same code, but now I can screenshot it, and I can video it, and I can single step it in a debugger on my computer instead of trying to touch the hardware while the hardware is busy drawing on the screen. So there's another top tip. Just because you're writing embedded software doesn't mean it has to run on the embedded system. You can run it on a desktop machine. I also have another one called the Queemu BIOS, where I run it in an emulated system, and then the terminal uh, appears on your computer. Again, great for debugging. So that, I guess, is the story. Is this sort of project I made? Is it spiraling out of control? Do I need help? I don't know. Come and talk to me afterwards. But I hope you've learned a little bit about embedded systems. It's OK to be messy. It's OK to have 19 different notebooks, one in every room of the house. And you, know, you can do fun things with embedded systems. So you, know, you should have a go. Now, I couldn't bring the hardware with me, so I'm going to talk you through uh, the final demo. This will be the climax of the presentation. Um, there's the BIOS screen, and there's the operating system. The operating system puts characters in shared RAM, and then the BIOS draws them in the background. I can type on the keyboard. Very hard to do one-handed. We've got a menu system with interactive help. shows all of the commands that are available. We've got a real-time clock chip, so it remembers the date, and it does the settings. You want to reset the settings, you pop the little coin cell battery out. We can change video modes on the fly. We can switch to this 60-line mode, and then we can switch back. And then there's audio support on the board, not just the PC speaker, but I fitted a little sound chip. You know, I was famous for doing synthesizer stuff. So next part of this demo, I'm just going to turn the volume down, because it defaults to maximum volume, and that's just going to do a bunch of clipping. It turns out the $1 microcontroller is fast enough to stream WAV files from the SD card into the codec. <laughs> and it's going to cut out there. We're just, uh, yeah, they want to get you a content strike. And we can do this. Hello, Eurorust. Hello, Eurorust. Now, that's my voice, um, which, uh, yeah, there's some, something I just need to explain here as I pause the video. I'd sound weirdly deep. Um, that's what happens if you play a 48 kilohertz uh, WAV file at 44 kilohertz. Every, someone was going, yeah, I know what you did. Yeah, no, the whole thing is pitch shifted. Uh, apparently, I need to like, write a WAV header parser, so look out for that in your favorite crates repository coming soon. Uh, next up, we're going to do the snake application, but this time it's not. The, uh, not the same Snake application we had before. This one is written in Rust. And Rust applications on an embedded system are compiled as ELF files, the embedded linking format. And you can't just put those in RAM, because they're huge. They're full of debug symbols. Yeah, see some nods. Uh, and all of the ELF parsers that exist assume you are a laptop or a computer, and you are doing debugging, and you can load the whole file. I can't. I don't have the RAM. So I wrote a brand new ELF parser in Rust from scratch, 
Uh, it's on crates.io. You're welcome. And so basically, the system can now program itself. It looks at the ELF file on disk without copying it all into RAM, and it pulls all the data segments. I had to learn the difference. Hands up if you know the difference between a section and a segment. A few people, yeah, weird and niche, isn't it? I had to learn this stuff. So we can load the snake program as an ELF straight off the disk into RAM, and we can run it. And now we are going to have the uh, longest and most tedious and most disappointing game of Snake you've ever seen. I mean, I warned you in advance, you're going to be deeply unsatisfied at this. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. We're gonna, I mean, this, is, this is not deliberate. This is me genuinely trying to play this game. And I missed. <laughs> Love it. OK. So that's it. That's been my talk. I mean, as I finished my, uh, my famous Monotron talk, this was never going to be a project that set the world on fire, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.